All right, now we're going to move into our next group of organisms, and that is the bacteria. We call the bacteria and the archaea the prokaryotes. Prokaryote means before a nucleus. So these are very simple, single-celled organisms that lack a nucleus and lack many of the organelles that we've talked about when we studied the cell. But we'll talk about some of the structures that are unique to the bacteria. Now remember, viruses are not cellular organisms. They live inside host cells because they only have a little bit of genetic material in the form of RNA or DNA and a protein covering. So the prokaryotes are truly one-celled organisms and they are very small. So they range in size from one to 10 micrometers in length. So we definitely need a microscope um, at and that would be an oil immersion microscope for best viewing of bacteria. If you were taking this course in person, you would be able to actually do that with our oil immersion microscopes. But bacteria is everywhere, in the air, water, and soil, and they cause a lot of infection among humans and animals, but they also do some good things. We use them in the food industry, in agriculture, and we also have them in our body on the surface and in our intestines, and that's part of our natural flora, which keeps us healthy. So we didn't even know that bacteria existed until the scientist Louis Pasteur did his work in about 1850. He discovered with his famous experiment that bacteria exist. So what he found is when he boiled a specialized broth in which bacteria like to grow, the, the broth was sterile when he boiled it. It killed, that high heat killed all the bacteria. And then when he put it outside, took the cap off and put it outside, he noticed that 89% of that, of those broth samples would show bacterial growth. If he opened it inside the building and very briefly, you know, opened it and shut it right away, he did the same outside and the same inside, he saw less bacterial growth. So that indicated that there was more bacteria outside in the air than there was inside in the air. But regardless, there was bacteria in both places because both vials showed growth. However, when he used this curved flask, this was a special flask that would take away any bacteria that is in the air because the, the bacteria cannot flow up the tube against gravity. So what he found then when he boiled the broth he found that there was bacteria here at the base of the flask, but there was no bacteria that could enter into the flask by climbing up this tube. So the broth was sterile when he used this curved tube and set it outside open to air. So then he knew that there was something in the air that was causing growth in this broth, and he was able to isolate and identify what was causing that growth, and that was the bacteria. So when we look at the bacterial structure, it's very simplified, very simple. These Again, these are one-celled organisms. They lack a nucleus, but they do have genetic material um, as DNA, but we call that region where we find the DNA the nucleoid region. The bacteria have an outer cell wall. Now, animal cells do not have a cell wall, but bacteria and plant cells do. So they, they have an outer cell wall and that keeps um, you know, things outside of the bacterial cell and gives it some sense of protection. And they also, some have flagella to help them propel in their environment, but they lack any type of membranous organelles. The really only organelle that we see in bacteria are the ribosomes for protein synthesis but we don't see any of the other larger organelles. So that makes the, these organisms very simple. And some have these accessory extra rings of DNA called, plas called plasmids. And those plasmids can contain special genes that helps bacteria become antibiotic resistant. So if you take a, if you have an infection and you take an antibiotic and that an antibiotic no longer works, it may be because that bacteria has acquired some new genes with the help of a plasmid to resist that antibiotic. And that's a real problem nowadays with all the infections that are floating around out there. 
you know, trying to find the, the best antibiotic to treat those infections without promoting those bacteria to mutate and fight those antibiotics. And then we have to come up with new antibiotics. And the production of antibiotics by pharmaceutical companies is not a high priority because we don't take antibiotics for very long. We only take them for a couple of days when we have an infection, and then we're done. People who like to fund research for new pharmaceuticals like to look at medications that people take every day, a couple of times a day, like maybe a blood pressure medication um, or medications that control blood sugar for people that are diabetic. Some of those long-term, lifelong medications, there's a lot of funding for that because there's a lot of money and income to the pharmaceutical companies for those everyday, lifelong medications. Antibiotics are not in that category, so therefore we are not very good at developing new antibiotics. But it's very important because antibiotic resistance is becoming a problem and people can die from bacterial infections that they can't treat. <laughs> so when you look at the structure of prokaryotes, of these bacteria, they have a cell envelope, and that cell envelope is made up of a special um, carbohydrate structure called the glycocalyx. It's made up of a cell wall. That's the outer portion that gives protection. And then the inner portion, the plasma membrane, which regulates materials coming in and out of the bacterial cell. In the cytoplasm, the fluid part of the cell, we find the nucleoid. Again, that's the DNA. That's the region where we find DNA in the bacteria. There's ribosomes. So ribosomes are for protein synthesis for making enzymes and allowing that bacteria to survive in its environment. And then thylakoids. The thylakoids are where photosynthesis occurs. So some bacteria uh, fall into the, the category of algae or cyanobacteria, and they can conduct photosynthesis. And then there's appendages, things coming off of the, of the outer membrane of the bacteria, and that can be a flagella for movement, conjugation pilus, that would be for inserting DNA and reproduction, and then fimbrae, and fimbrae are just finger-like extensions for attaching to different uh, surfaces. So the capsule is just a protective outer covering, and it's made up of a carbohydrate layer called the glycocalyx, and then in attached to the outside of that are these short little hair-like structures called fimbrae, and that's al that allows the bacteria to stick to surfaces. The nucleoid, we said, was the region in which we would find DNA. And then we might find this single conjugation pilus, and this is what allows a bacteria to come near another bacteria and inject its DNA into another bacterium. So it's a means of reproduction between bacterial cells. And then the cell wall is inside of this capsule. And again, that provides shape to the bacterial cell and gives it support and uh, some protection from the environment as well. And then we have these small ribosomes where protein synthesis occurs. So when we look at bacteria, they can reproduce by themselves by a process called binary fission. Binary fission is just the splitting of one bacterium into two. So it's like a copy machine. And the benefit of binary fission is the cells can, can um, divide very rapidly and they can take over a body very quickly. When you think of, uh, if you've ever had strep throat, how quickly that proceeds and you feel terrible because that bacteria is, is just multiplying so quickly in your body. And it takes as long as 12 minutes for those cells to undergo what we call a generation time, and that is a curve that rises very quickly, and only bacteria are capable of that type of reproduction. And it's simply because binary fission is so rapid, it's just a, a splitting of the cell into two very quickly, and it's an exact copy machine. But mutations can occur during this process, and that will again be very quickly um, passed on to the next offspring as those cells divide and split in half and, and make copies of one another very quickly. So when we look at um, binary fission, it's just simply that um, kind of uh, division of the cytoplasm and the nucleoid, the DNA replicates, and we have two copies, exact copies of that bacterial cell. 
other means of reproduction in bacterial cells, we have conjugation. That's where we have that conjugation pilus that we found on that previous page here. That's where it injects its material into the other bacterial cell. So that is um, called conjugation. And that is um, when we have one cell, just like I said, injecting DNA to another cell. And then transformation is when there is some DNA in the environment. So it's free pieces of DNA in the environment are taken up by a bacterial cell. So it's either from a dead bacteria or for a, from a nearby live bacteria, and it just picks up that DNA and incorporates it into the cell. That's called transformation, and that can result in bacteria that are different from previous generations. And another one is transduction. Transduction is when we have a bacteriophage, and that's a special virus that infects bacteria, and that can insert uh, portions of DNA from one bacterial cell to another. And that is uh, the results, again, of a, of a virus that infects bacteria. So when we look at bacteria, we look at, we can classify them as gram positive or gram negative depending upon a special chemical found in the cell wall, and that's called peptidoglycan. And we find that some have a thicker cell wall than others. Gram positive cells have a thicker cell wall than gram negative cells. And when we stain bacteria, we find that the thicker cell wall of the gram positive bacteria causes it to retain this first stain that's used which is crystal violet, and that gives it that dark purple appearance. But um, when we continue the staining technique, we take that crystal violet and we wash it out with alcohol, and then we use safranin, uh, which is a red um, stain. And what we find is that turns the bacteria red. So gram-negative bacteria, because they have a thinner cell wall, do not retain the first dye that we use that, that actually gets washed away, and the second dye that's used is retained, and that gives those cells a red appearance. So gram-positive bacteria have a dark purple appearance, and they have a thicker cell wall, and gram-negative bacteria have a red appearance due to the thinner cell wall. So we can look at this diagram here. Uh, here's the crystal violet that's applied first, then we use Graham's iodine, then we wash it with alcohol, and then we use the red dye, the safranin. So we can see if it's a gram positive and has a very thick cell wall, it's going to retain that purple stain throughout the staining process because it, that thick cell wall absorbs that crystal violet and keeps it. But if we look at the gram negative bacteria, we can see it starts out purple but then it's washed away by the alcohol. The purple is washed away and then restained again with the safranin. So that's gram negative bacteria. And this slide here is a mixture of gram positive and gram negative bacteria. You can see that some are dark purple, those are the gram positive, and some are red, that's the gram negative. So we can also look at bacteria by their shapes. There's a spiral-shaped bacteria, a rod-shaped bacteria, and a round-shaped bacteria. When it has a um, kind of a spiral shape, we call that spirilli. Bacilli is a rod shape, so if it looks like a little, um, best way is kind of like a tic-tac is what they look like, if you remember what tic-tacs look like. Um, that's what a bacillus looks like. It's a rod-shaped bacteria. And then if it's perfectly round, little circles, little dark purple circles, we call that cocci. Or if we have one, we call it a coccus. You've heard of staphylococcus before, or maybe you've heard of streptococcus before. Strep throat is caused by streptococcus bacteria, and that is a type of bacteria that is round in appearance. So when we look at bacteria, we can kind of uh, classify them according to how they use oxygen. If they are required to live in the presence of oxygen, we call them obligate aerobes. Aerobic means using oxygen, 
So that means if they are obligated to grow in oxygen, that means they will die if there is no oxygen. So these are obligate aerobes. And there are some bacteria that die in the presence of oxygen. So we call them obligate anaerobes, which means they cannot survive with, ox with oxygen. They don't like oxygen. So botulism, gas, gangrene, and tetanus are examples of bacteria that don't like oxygen. Now you've heard of getting your tetanus shot. That is that um, commonly can be inserted into our skin and that bacterium can grow when we have puncture wounds because puncture wounds open up the skin and then the skin closes behind that puncture and it's an oxygen-free environment. So the bacteria can grow in that wound because the wound is closed and not open to air. So any type of puncture wound, when you step on something sharp and the skin closes, you know, after the, after the injury, that puts someone at risk for tetanus. And that's another reason why they won't stitch up dirty wounds. Like if you cut yourself working out in the field, they, oftentimes they won't stitch those up because they don't want to trap bacteria under the skin in an oxygen-free environment. And these obligate anaerobes can thrive and survive and cause serious infection. They like to leave, you know, dirty wounds open to air and just clean them out really good. And then we have facultative anaerobes, which means they can grow with or without oxygen. Another type of bacteria we have are the autotrophic bacteria. And these are bacteria that can make their own food. They get their energy from a source other than um, other living organisms or um, like when we think of algae, for example, those are photoautotrophs. They use light to make energy. So they can they use solar energy to make oxygen. And most of the oxygen in the atmosphere is produced by algae in our oceans. So when we think about the importance of our waterways and of our oceans and the algae that exists there, that's where our free oxygen in the environment, most of it comes from. So it's so important that we protect our waterways so we have um, access to this free oxygen produced by the algae. Chemoautotrophs is when they're using some type of chemical for energy, something that is not you know, found freely in the soil, but might be in more extreme environments. And we'll talk about that when we get to the archaea. So heterotrophic bacteria are those that just break down, you know, dying things in the environment. We know that something that has bacteria in it smells kind of nasty. And that's because it gives off different gases, particularly sulfur-based gases, have a kind of an obnoxious odor. And when things are infectious or, or breaking down with bacteria, they tend to have a bad odor. But that's a great thing because it's necessary to break things. You know, dead animals, roadkill, are broken down by bacteria and converted into nutrients for the soil and other organisms. So it eventually breaks down and is a sign of a healthy ecosystem when the bacteria are doing their job. And there's not, you know, uh, too much, obviously, decay and destruction uh, when we have just the right amount. So some bacteria can actually... Um, be what we call commensal in that we have two species living together and the, for example, the obligate anaerobes in our, in our intestine help us um, kind of control the bad bacteria that can come into our body and the E. coli as long as they stay where they're supposed to be and that's in our digestive tract and it doesn't end up, you know, in open wounds or infecting others in the environment, those anaerobes are perfectly happy to live there. Mutualism is when both species benefit from the environment, from the association. So when we look at the bacteria in the human intestine, some of those bacteria release vitamin B12, which we need for red blood cell con production, and vitamin K, which we need for blood clotting. So those are really important things for humans, and we benefit from those bacteria living in our intestines.
But the E. coli don't really benefit us. They don't do any trouble if they just stay in our intestines. But the E. coli survive in our intestines and they benefit from living there. But we don't really benefit from the E. coli in our intestines. But we do benefit from the vitamin K and the B12 that bacteria in our intestines give off. So that's an example of mutualism. Commensalism is just one member benefits. In this case, it's the bacteria, the E. coli that benefits. Again, mutualism, we benefit and the bacteria benefit. They have a place to live and survive and we get the vitamin K and B12. Parasitism is where one benefits and the other suffers. The host suffers as a result of the relationship. So a perfect example of that is food poisoning. If you get bacteria into your system from eating some food that has a high bacterial count, you're going to get very sick from that. Some people have even died from food poisoning. So that's an example of parasitism, where one benefits and the other one is negatively infected. So we have lots of diseases that are bacterial in nature. So we talked in the last video on viruses, those that were viral in nature. These diseases in this chart are bacterial in nature. So the good news is we can use antibiotics for a lot of these diseases. So if a person picks up an STD, gonorrhea, chlamydia, those can be treated with antibiotics and they can go away permanently. It's not something that someone has to live with their entire lives, like the viral STDs, for example, like AIDS, um, HPV, and herpes. Those are with us for life, but these diseases can go away with antibiotic treatments. So I'm not going to go through each one of these. You can just kind of read through that list. But when we look at trying to treat bacterial infections then, antibiotics are uh, the medicines that we have designed to fight infection, and thank goodness for that, because uh, World War II was a whole different uh, ball game once we in invented these antibiotics and were able to use them to treat our soldiers in war, because prior to the development of antibiotics, um, that was the number one cause of death among our soldiers was just simple infections that they picked up from the battlefield. So there's different uh, classes that antibiotics fall into depending on how they work. If they inhibit protein synthesis, then those are the erythromycin and tetracycline antibiotics. Other ones put holes in the cell wall and the bacteria basically implode. They, they cannot contain their cytoplasm because they have a broken down cell wall. So the penicillins, the ampicillins, and the fluoroquinolone, those are all um, antibiotics that break down the cell wall. But again, um, it doesn't harm the host cell. It only harms the bacterial cells. Because remember, animal cells and human cells, right, we don't have cell walls. So it doesn't hurt the host organism when they take antibiotics. It just kills the bacteria in that host. But we know that bacterial resistance is increasing, and 90% of staph infections are resistant to penicillin. And there's another uh, stronger antibiotic called methicillin, and the, there's something we call MRSA. Maybe you've heard of this. It stands for methicillin resistant staph aureus. So this is a very common bacteria, staph aureus. It's an infectious bacteria. Some people have it in their nose and it just kind of resides there. It colonizes there and doesn't really cause the individual any illness, but they can spread illness to others. For example, my husband had it in his nose and he spread empatigo to our children, which is staph aureus infections of the skin. And we finally realized the source of it. And he had a special ointment that he put in his nose and it took care of that staph aureus. So some people have it in their nose and they don't even realize it. Um, MRSA can be anywhere. The MRSA can be in the urine, it can be in the sputum, it can be in the saliva, it can be in an old infected wound. It can be in a number of places. So it's a very serious infection in healthcare facilities that we really try to work hard on controlling. But if you ever cut yourself nowadays, it's always a good idea to just put some antibiotic right away because we're seeing more and more infections, you know, especially with this MRSA. It's a real problem in wrestling, uh, in the sport of wrestling, because, you know, with people 
um, sweating and having close skin contact with the mats and the moist environments and the heat and the humidity. It just really promotes the growth of bacteria. And the Staph aureus, you know, can really grow well in crowded conditions like a wrestling meet. So very, very important that we shower. If you know anybody who wrestles, very, very important that they shower and wash their clothes and, and just try to maintain as good of hygiene as possible because of the risk of infection with MRSA and Staph aureus. So we talked about the cyanobacteria. I said that they had those thylakoids, which are those special organelles for conducting photosynthesis. These are very, very important um, bacteria because they make up uh, the bottom of the food chain, the blue-green algae, and they're a really important part of our environment. They are, you know, what has thought to be the first to produce oxygen into the atmosphere. And together with the other groups of algae, you know, we know that that's the number one contributor to the oxygen in the atmosphere is the algae in our oceans and waterways. So when we look at these bacteria, when would they associate with the fungus on a tree, on the surface of a tree, the, the bark, you can see these lichens. And lichens are those kind of flaky, light green, white little patches you see on tree trunks. Um, that's an example of mutualism where the two organisms are living together, a fungus and cyanobacteria. And these are can be a little problematic when we have too much carbon dioxide and nutrients from fertilizers flowing into our lakes, especially here in Wisconsin. We can get this pollution, this blue-green algae where the dogs were getting sick and some people were getting sick. Maybe you heard of that a couple of years ago when we have really, really hot summers and uh, and rains where we have the, the fertilizers running off the farm fields that really causes the growth of these uh, cyanobacteria and they can overgrow lakes and crowd out the sunlight so the plants lower down in the lake can't grow and the bacteria and the, the algae overgrow in the lake and it kills the fish and kills the plants and, and can make people sick. So we try to uh, limit runoff where we can but it becomes more and more difficult with all the farm farming that's going on here in Wisconsin. So this is just some microscopic images of cyanobacteria. Here we can just see that they're green in color. They have a cell wall like all bacteria do, but they have this these special thylakoids, and these are the photosynthetic structures for those to produce photosynthesis, taking the sunlight and carbon dioxide and turning it into oxygen. So the archaea are these kind of special group of organisms. They used to be clumped in with the bacteria, but we found that they're so different that they, that they deserve really their own name. And they live in extremely harsh conditions. So they, they live in the hot springs of, over in Wyoming and Yellowstone, those bubbling sulfur springs. We see those in Iceland as well. Um, the salty lakes, they thrive on salt. So halophiles are, are those the, um, archaea that live on salt. Methanogens, they live on methane. I'm sorry, they live on, they produce methane because methanogen means to, to make, generate. So they make methane from hydrogen gas and carbon dioxide. So in these marshes in, in the bottom where there's not a lot of sunlight again and not many plants, you know, these are kind of smelly areas that, you know, methane is a, is what we find when some, a, a human being or a cow or an animal passes gas. That's methane gas, so it has kind of a noxious odor. And um, so in these marshes that don't get much sunlight and are kind of mucky, we find these methanogens that are producing methane from the hydrogen gas and carbon dioxide found in those anaerobic marshes. And again, the hot sulfur springs, like I said, we find in you know Yellowstone National Park. Those are called thermoacidophiles, which means they love heat and they love acidic conditions. So the next group of organisms we're going to talk about are the protists. There's not going to be much to test on with the protists, but I want to just give you a quick overview. So I will have a YouTube video that reviews some of the major protist groups. And that concludes the videos for this unit on viruses, bacteria, and protists.